before I begin, I'm going to do a brief presentation, talk a little bit about sort of uh, the state of the world as it relates to stress and burnout at the moment. But let me give you a little more detail on our panelists. I uh, am co-founders, chief medical officer uh, from Equilibrium, as you might have guessed, a physician. Uh, and um, I uh, am director of employee well-being for the Florida campus of Mayo Clinic. Um, amongst other uh, roles and responsibilities there. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, introducing our panelists, uh, Lorna Kopel. I've, I'm taking everyone's bios and shorting them. Uh, no disrespect to our wonderful panelists, but they are all so uh, esteemed that if I read the full bios, we would probably be through the entire webinar. So I'm going to shorten them up a little bit uh, and give you a flavor of, of their background. So with Lorna, in her role as Director of Information Security, Lorna is responsible for providing leadership and vision for information security areas across the university, including serving as the leading authority and advisor to senior leadership, developing strategic plans, managing a broad catalog of information security services, managing policies and procedures, leading risk assessments and security reviews, providing leadership for incident response and management, performing community outreach and education, and supervising a team of information security professionals. My goodness, quite a bit. Uh, prior to coming to Tufts, she served as vice president and chief information security officer at Iron Mountain, an enterprise information management services company. Uh, next, uh, Julie Fitton. Julie is a highly motivated, experienced leader with expert proficiency in product and corporate security, delivering comprehensive and efficient cyber protection strategies. Julie combines security industry expertise with business strategic thinking to assist in the development of security features that serve as differentiators in product positioning. Julie is currently a vice president of digital product security for Stanley Black, Black & Decker. She serves as trustee and audit committee chair for a Massachusetts Community Savings Bank and is an adjunct professor at Boston College. Uh, Joe Ruchko, as uh, a governance risk and compliance analyst for Mequilibrium, MeQ. Uh, Joe's key responsibilities include assessing MeQ suppliers, writing and updating information security policies, uh, standards and controls, performing risk assessments, delivering information security awareness activities, and managing MeQ's DEI compliance training program. Previously, Joe held various business analysts, uh, analysis, excuse me, IT software quality assurance governance, risk and compliance um, and United Way fundraising positions at the Hanover Insurance Group. Uh, finally, not last but not least, uh, Pascal Freeman, a hands-on solutions-oriented information technology, information security and compliance professional with experience in software design and development, systems design and development and network and data security. Pascal has overseen all aspects of information security programs, including policy development and enforcement, internal and external audits, third-party risk management, and contact with client information security personnel. Pascal is MeQ's compliance and data privacy champion and leads efforts to ensure the organization's compliance with relevant data protection, data privacy, and accessibility statutes, including HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, slash CPRA, and Section 508. So as you can see, we, we really have a very talented and accomplished panel, and I'm sure we'll have a very rich discussion. So let me sort of set the stage, and, and none of this will probably come as a major shock to you, but uh, let me start by saying that we are clearly living uh, during a very difficult time for multiple reasons. Um, and in fact, when you think about sort of moments when perhaps as communities, as a society, uh, people have experienced sort of a collective trauma or collective tra traumatic events, uh, this moment with the pandemic and all that's going on sort of checks all the boxes. And these events can have obviously significant impacts on our, on our mental health. I mean, the current moment we find ourselves you know, with this pandemic that we've all been dealing with. I mean, again, certainly is chronic and unrelenting. It's obviously pervasive and, and impacting multiple, if not all aspects of our lives. It's global in nature. 
Uh, in some ways, it certainly feels out of control and certainly is out of our control by and large. And there's been times where we've maybe had false hope, oh, we're coming out now, and then there's some new variant, and, and the goalposts really seem to shift. And this can lead us to potentially start to feel helpless, hopeless, and, and traumatized. And, and what do we really do when we're facing you know, this kind of a moment in our lives? And that's what we want to try to talk about, what we can do as individuals, and certainly as organizations, as companies, to help uh, you know, support our employees. We know that this current moment, we know stress was a problem prior, uh, you know, sort of without a doubt. I used to talk a lot about burnout and stress, you know, well before the pandemic hit. And, and as I've just been saying, I think this current moment sort of has amplified those issues. And the research really supports that. I think when we look specifically at cybersecurity personnel, practitioners, we can see pretty, pretty astounding numbers. I mean, this particular survey that was published in Information Security Magazine, I mean, 91% of cybersecurity professionals had experienced mental health challenges at work. 70% of organizations are understaffed, and that's probably a big part of what's driving some of those mental health challenges. Certainly, we see that in healthcare as well. And, and interestingly, you know, 50 plus percent of the responders attributed the problem to the high stress nature of their jobs. And, and to a certain degree, you know, that kind of comes with the territory, but but also poor culture, poor management style, and things that really are um, opportunities to, to for change. And, and I think that's also what we want to try to tease out today in, in our discussion with our panelists. Now, it's interesting when we've looked across our book of business, more specifically at IT employees, cybersecurity employees, who are within companies that utilize equilibrium, And again, we look at 18 different factors overall in terms of assessing resilience uh, at the individual level. And then of course, looking at things that are more aggregated, the corporate level, a company level. It, you know, the numbers aren't quite as dire. I mean, but, but there's reasons for that. So on average, uh, your MEQ score or the IT employees MEQ score of, um, across all of our businesses is, is about average with the rest of, of the professionals um, that we uh, work with. I think there are some nuances and, and some things to certainly take note of. I think it's important to recognize that 15%, which is a pretty significant percentage, are really facing more significant mental health challenges, whether that's uh, under the rubric of anxiety, anxiety disorders, uh, not only burnout, but true depression. I think when you look at that burnout number of 6%, you might think, well, that's not so high, but that's actually extreme burnout, right? And, and, and burnout, in many ways, one way to think about it is uh, many sources sort of describe it as kind of a part of a continuum. This is somewhat debated in the literature, but, you know, from being, you know, not stressed or feeling great to maybe needing to be admitted into a, you know, psychiatric institution, most of us are somewhere in the middle uh, either feeling relatively stressed or then we tip over to this area called burnout. You know, we're really starting to feel um, emotionally exhausted, perhaps ineffective in our work, cynical. These are kind of the key components of burnout. But then even beyond that, there's, you know, getting into real uh, mental health issues, such as I was mentioning earlier with depression, anxiety, even uh, OCD type behaviors. So I, I think we need to be cognizant of that the six percent of the people who are really suffering, and and that the number in general is more akin to what we saw in the previous data, where a large majority of of IT professionals are really struggling with stress and with burnout specifically. I could spend a lot of time on this slide, but I want to make sure that we we move on to have time for our panelists, so we can certainly get back to some of this data. What's interesting is when you look at moments again like we are experiencing you know things that i might characterize as a collective trauma for all of us there's this law of thirds that tends to apply which is that about a third of people really struggle and really sort of um uh kind of sink in this moment and and, and have um, challenges that require intervention about a third of people sort of manage to just barely keep their head above water kind of tread water but a third of people actually are able to thrive and grow from these sorts of moments. And, you know, the question is, how do we get in 
to that third? How do we move ourselves or our employees into that third? How do we move our companies into that third? Because you can look at it that way as well. There's interesting research looking at how corporations deal with moments such as this, and, and the same sort of law of thirds tends to apply. I think on the individual level, uh, there is this concept that, you know, maybe in some ways it's been around forever, because certainly the concept of growing from suffering or from challenge is a part of all the world's religions. And, you know, as, as a concept has been around, you know, maybe as long as, as we have, but, but it was uh, more recently that psychologists began to talk about this term of what's referred to as post-traumatic growth. And that is really, how can we do what I've just really said? How can we learn to actually grow? Not only kind of tread water, but truly grow and, and evolve um, when we're facing, you know, real ad adversity. Um, when you look at the literature, there are certainly uh, a number of keys that really relate to our ability to be resilient. One is that we need to have the right mindset. And that really is, is a important concept as it relates to stress in general and something that I lecture about quite a bit. Most of the time, it's, it's less about the issue that you are feeling stressed over and more about your perspective around that issue, sort of the way that you are viewing that issue or what might call them your mindset related to that issue. And certainly if we can learn to develop more of a growth mindset when we face these challenges in our lives, whatever those challenges may be, that is one way for us to grow from these challenging moments. And again, it's not to, um, to invalidate the challenges themselves. In fact, even recognizing that the moment is challenging it, but in the midst of this, can we still find a way to grow and evolve? And, and um, part of the key to being able to do that and to be able to form that kind of a growth mindset and maintain it is to be able to prioritize a certain level of self-care. Uh, again, even while things are shifting and maybe challenging. And then finally, I wanted to mention this concept of gratitude. And, you know, when I bring it up, even I, I always feel like, you know, some of the audience may feel it's kind of Pollyannish and we should hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And it's really not what I'm saying. I think, you know, again, it's not about denying how challenging this moment, any moment in your life or any event in your life may be. But it is recognizing that if you can, even in the midst of a challenging moment or situation, if you can focus on, turn some of your focus to those things that you can be thankful for, that that is a way to help you grow through these challenging moments. And, and research actually supports this. There's a very interesting study out of South Korea that looked at uh, people facing traumatic moments in their lives and what often can happen and we've all experienced this at times, you know, we begin to ruminate what sometimes is referred to as mind wandering. We start thinking about all these things and either sort of mind wandering, ruminating into the past, what may be, or, or sign of getting caught in the, or excuse me, into the future, what may be, or getting caught in the past and thinking about what, what's occurred. And that can be really uh, disruptive, cause a lot of undue suffering. That in this particular study, though, one of the sort of antidotes was that if you could intentionally think about those things and try to focus on those things that you could be thankful for, that that was a way to sort of pull yourself out of that moment and actually ultimately learn to grow and bring about this concept of post-traumatic growth. So just as we kind of get into this discussion, I wanted, wanted you all to be able to keep, keep this in mind. So again, by, by design, uh, my, my comments were brief. They were intended to really sort of set the stage here. And what I'll do now is uh, we'll turn it over to each one of our panelists uh, to say a few words. I'll, I'll stop sharing screen and, and then we'll, we'll get right into some, some more, more of a fireside chat type uh, discussion. So as I'm stopping to share here, uh, Julie, why don't I turn it over to you first? Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Um, that was a really great overview and there was a lot of, uh, key concepts there that I certainly could personally relate to and see playing out in my teams. Um, so thank you for that overview. Um, for, for the folks here that are attending, Julie Fitton, um, Dr. Perlman did a great job on my bio, so I won't repeat who I am um, today, but just to give you a bit of a reflection on where I've come from, I have really um, have been a security practitioner as long as I've been in the workforce. 
Uh, it was something that I did before it was even really a profession or a discipline. Um, when people sort of said, hey, you know, you've got a good mindset for abuse cases. Why don't you take on the security work uh, when there weren't frameworks to align to and other guidance and have really grown up throughout my career in cybersecurity. And I've seen a lot of the stress that um, the discipline itself creates on people, on my staff. Uh, it is a very stressful position. You're held accountable for a lot of things when you only have influence ability to fix them. You don't always have direct control. And that unto itself can be a very stressful aspect of our field. And, you know, you add to that times of um, economic stress, social stress, challenges in the environment in which we're operating, um, you know, Dr. Perlman's point on family in other aspects that are outside of the workplace that add stress, then you layer on top of that the stresses that the field itself creates, um, responding to incidents, trying to drive organizational change, trying to convince people to um, behave in certain ways that might be counter to the rest of their um, motivations for why they show up to work every day is certainly a significant challenge and drives a lot of stress for people within this field. Um, you know, what I've seen also mounting in more recent times um, is a push, and I, I consider this kind of more of a broad consideration <clears throat> as it relates to industry professionals and technology regardless, uh, not just for cybersecurity, but really a push for self-sufficiency in the workforce. Um, services that had been available to, to people earlier in earlier days of my career, like executive administrative support, um, management support, support resources from HR, where you have a human that you can call up and talk to and talk through some of the challenges. A lot of those things have been replaced with streamlined organizations, with automation, with call centers, where you do still receive um, the activities and support that are absolutely required to keep things going, but you don't necessarily get the emotional support side of things. And that degree of self-sufficiency and knowledge um, needs to be assumed. And so, you know, some of the ways that I've worked to try and address that within my teams, and, and we'll get into a full panel on some of these, but just to reflect on it a little bit here, is with really trying to listen to people's concerns to be that sounding board for them um, and to let my team know day in and day out that making mistakes is not only okay, it's expected that mistakes are going to happen. We're going to have missteps. They're not going to be judged for it. They're not going to be um, ridiculed for it. Of course, big mistakes, there may be some judgment, um, but for some of the smaller inconsequential things that, you know, making sure people feel that they're not expected to be perfect in everything, in every aspect that they do, um, recognizing that they come to work to be security professionals, even though we're asking them to do a lot of other things in their day to day work and realizing and recognizing in that pool of other things um, that we're there to help support them and provide them with some flexibility to make some mistakes throughout their day. So that's just a really quick summary and reflection on my point of view on this topic. I'll hand it over to Lorna for her point of view. Thank you, Julie. And I reiterate um, everything that, that Julie said, and I'd like to um, add some, some kind of different aspects to this. Uh, I too have seen, um, been doing you know professional security work for well over 20 years and have seen the the change in the industry and the change in the impact on on the security teams as it's gone from being just blended into IT to actually having dedicated teams and the impact on the team and the um, the leadership to give you a little context of kind of some of the things I'm going to say is give you an idea about Tufts University. And, you know, it's, it's, we have the same security problems as any other institution, but we're different in the fact that we're actually like a small city. We have schools, we have health clinics, we have police, and we have lots of transient people that are actually in our environment, which creates a number of challenges. We have about 12,000 
uh, undergrad, graduate, and professional students, and another 5,000 faculty staff, and another 10 to 15,000 that are that are in our environment doing things, um, but are very loosely affiliated. And so that that creates uh, uh, challenges for how do we work with the community and, and impact um, our security posture. Also, our, our schools have very di different and diverse missions. So the risks they face, the threats, and the compliance frameworks that they have to deal with um, are wide ranging. I have a small team. I have, uh, there's seven of us um, doing this. And then some of the day-to-day -day is distributed into IT, like running firewalls and antivirus and stuff like that. So we have a professional challenges as well, where we're, we have schools, we have dental school doing, having lots of clinics. We have the medical school um, in training doctors and they're out in the field, um, the veterinary clinics. And we are a tier one research institution and we do research globally. So we have, um, the university is about a lot of activism, community, uh, giving back to the community. What are we doing to make the community better? And so we have people that are you know, using technology and gathering privacy data, um, you know, pri data that would be considered under privacy in, in pretty rough conditions around the world, uh, out in the field in, in a lot of different countries. So the challenge this brings from us from to my security team is the fact that they often are drug into doing things that are really not security. Just like, like Julie said is because there's so much decentralization, it is really hard to teach and get people to remember because we have such turnover on how they play a part in security. And, you know, you think about it, a lot of our environment is BYOD. So people have, are, uh, are trying to do work with sensitive data and connecting to sensitive things, but we don't have any control over their technology and, and their approach. So um, a lot of the things that we try to change, we have to bake into, and as security professionals, we try to bake things into the business processes. Well, when the business processes um, aren't well understood and have a lot of um, inefficiencies in them, it's really hard to bake security into that. And so I know my team feels a lot of, of stress that they're they're doing things that are wasting their time. They're not working on security. They're not able to make progress because we do a lot of the same things over and over again. And the time we spend, you know, gathering information to do like security reviews for research projects and, and third party reviews, you know, we have, oftentimes will end up being like architects and having to pull together what is the design. And so it makes it really, um, you know, it's like, why isn't somebody else doing this? So one of the things that we started to talk about is, and, and people are feeling very disconnected from making progress in security. So one of the things that I've realized, and it was a really good, what Dr. Coleman brought up earlier, is, is changing your perspective. And so, you know, the team can get to feel like, well, why isn't somebody making a decision? Why isn't somebody fixing this? Why isn't somebody else doing this work? And the, one of the mantras that we've really tried to work on with the team is, you know, the, the age old adage of, you know, worry about the things that you can control and don't worry about the things that you can't control. But the things that we can't control are affecting our security posture in a big way. So we've added another dimension to that, which is, you know, worry about the things that are specifically your responsibilities, but then how do we focus on enabling others? And giving, and, and instead of thinking about why aren't they doing this, let's say, what can we do to help them do better? And, you know, getting materials, teaching them to self-fish so we don't have to review every security project for privacy concerns and things like that. So another, so that caused a lot of stress so they feel like they're wasting their time. And so another transition was trying to get the team to look at what are the things we're focusing on? Because that, that cycle, it goes through your head. We were talking about, um, the, you know, the hamster wheel is we got to have people thinking about what are you supposed to be focusing on and make that clear and make them feel comfortable that that is what they can focus on and they can let go of the rest. So, you know, what are your clear roles, responsibilities, your objectives? What's the roadmap of what you're working on? And then the key part, you know, and again, it resonated with, you know, the gratitude that Dr. Poman talked about is we are trying to bake in throughout the entire IT organization is routinely recognizing success, how we've made progress, because it doesn't feel like you're making progress when every day 
you're fighting to get things done. You're, you're, you've got so much work to do. You can't get it all done. But when we do have some improvements, let's recognize and celebrate that. And that has actually started to help people because they just don't recognize and see that there has been progress made. So, you know, as we look at the team, the other key things that we're doing is, you know, I've always tried to build within my security team a sense of family so that no matter what happens outside of the security team, that, you know, we're here for each other and we take care of each other. We balance for each other so that people, when they need to take time, they need to do things, we try to cover for each other. So there's a lot that you can do to make them feel welcomed and help manage their stress level that um, is important for leaders to recognize and take that into account from, you know, what can we do differently? So that's kind of a summary of kind of my perspective and the things that we've been dealing with so that you can get a sense of, of uh, reality for us. And Pascal, I think you want to go next. Yeah. So thanks so much, Lorna. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Dr. Perlman. Um, you know, I think you've set the stage really well for some of the things that that we can talk about here today. And I think, you know, it's really important for us as, as leaders to recognize that we have an outsized role in setting the tone for how our teams can deal with stress, um, how they can deal with, um, you know, potentially those things that cause burnout. And, you know, while it's true that everyone can build individual skills, I think, you know, as leaders, we can look at the teams that we're managing, whether, you know, they're people that we are, that directly report to us or who are in other parts of the organization who need to be um, engaging with us and with our teams. Um, you know, so that we can really help them understand that, you know, what we're doing in this space is not scary. It's not, um, you know, it's not a threat. Um, we're not here to say no. Um, you know, and I think that there's a, a couple of things from MeQ's program, uh, a couple of concepts that I think really apply here. And, you know, one of the things that is kind of core to the MeQ journey is identifying what are your iceberg beliefs. And, you know, as with an iceberg, you know, there's only that little itty bitty bit that's above the surface. And that's the bit that you're aware of. And then beneath the surface, you've got, you know, the other 98% of that iceberg that's really driving a lot of the things that, that you're doing, that your teams are doing. And so as, as leaders, we can, can apply that by saying, okay, what is causing my team to have some stress here? What is causing the people who come to us to, you know, not want to talk to us, to not want to engage with the things that we're trying to do? And, you know, from there, we're able to move into, and, and, and Dr. Perlman can probably explain this a little bit better than I can, but it's a, you know, a process we call trap it, map it, and zap it, where we recognize that something's happening, we recognize why it's happening, and then we zap it by, you know, applying a healthy behavior um, so that we can, can mitigate the negative impacts of that stress. Um, you know, I think a couple of the icebergs that, you know, we, we tend to fall into, and I think this is, is kind of true, not only for security professionals, but for the folks who have to come interface with us, is that the idea, you know, that there's this idea that security and what we're doing is this win or lose zero sum game, right? Where, you know, you either completely succeed or you don't, or you completely fail. And so Julie, as you're giving your team room to, to, to make some mistakes or to, to try something that may or may not work. Um, you know, that's, I think a really important way to help mitigate burnout, um, among, among our teams. I think another, um, sort of iceberg around the idea of burnout in general is that, you know, it's only work that contributes to burnout. In reality, um, you know, the literature shows that burnout manifests primarily at work. But now that we're, 
you know, all, you know, we're in a variety of different um, working situations now. Some people are all in the office and that can be stressful. Some people are all at home and that can be stressful. And so as leaders, as we're working with our teams, um, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, there may be other things going on that we can't see that we need to, to interact with and, and give our team members a little bit of grace to, to kind of work through, um, you know, and also recognizing that, um, you know, we are dealing with people here. We're not dealing with, you know, an algorithm, um, you know, we're not dealing with a, an AI. Um, you know, and finally, the, the last thing that I'll just kind of mention here before I turn it over to Joe, um, you know, is that the things that we're talking about here are sort of universal struggles that all organizations, all security practitioners have to deal with it at some point in their career, whether it's at a smaller organization like Equilibrium, where about 150 people, um, or, you know, at a much larger organization, um, you know, like a Tufts that has, you know, tens of thousands and, and a Stanley Black & Decker that's got, you know, uh, a whole host of people there too. So, you know, these are, are sort of universal things. And, you know, to the extent that that as leaders and as senior folks on our teams, um, you know, we can, you know, provide some of that kind of top-down leadership to, to look at what are the icebergs that are driving, you know, some of my team's behavior? What are the icebergs that are driving uh, the way that the organization comes to talk to us? And what are some ways that we can really mitigate that? Um, and I think that that's really good. Um, you know, Joe has has joined my team earlier this year, and he's previously been in much larger organizations. And so, um, you know, I'd love to hear you know his perspective um, on on what he's seen in the industry over the years, and and in particular, you know, kind of um, you know his reflections on what's happened, you know, in like the, the the big organization versus a small organization and what that overlap looks like. And I believe you're on mute, Joe. Uh, thank you, Pascal, very much for that, that kind intro. And I also want to thank Dr. Perlman and I also want to thank um, all of my distinguished panelists for some of their uh, fantastic comments. So as Pascal said, I have been, I've had the great fortune of being part of several organizations of different sizes from large to small. And you know, one thing that I've noticed throughout my experience as a practitioner, an information security practitioner, is that um, it seems that burnout and stress seem to melt away when employees have a sense of psychological safety. And in, in my belief and in my experience, um, a sense of psychological safety is fostered by compassionate leaders and compassionate leadership. And I think that this compassionate leadership ideal kind of dovetails with Lorna's concept over at Tufts, which is that, that sense of family where everyone is supporting each other. And also, I think that, you know, this sense of psychological safety is also fostered by uh, reasonable management expectations. Um, fair expectations. And this kind of harkens back to uh, Julie's comments about how employees, when they are, you know, allowed to fail or make mistakes, and they, they don't have any judgment that is thrust upon them. I think that when management exudes all of these ideals, compassion, and kind of an understanding and, and not a pursuit of perfection, I think that employees become psychologically safe. And this psychological safety, in my view, is kind of like an exceptional power that allows individuals to be resilient. And it, it gives them the opportunity to practice self-care. And when folks are resilient and practice self-care, then they have this tremendous power and this sense of this ability to take risks. And when, when folks take risks, they're more likely to collaborate and they're more likely to innovate and they're more likely to bring their best selves to work. And, you know, I, I just want to kind of pull in a quote or a stat that Dr. Perlman started this, this webinar with, and it's a study from Information Security Magazine, and it goes like this, 51% um, of 
uh, respondents in a survey said that their mental health struggles were caused by poor culture and management styles. So I think that there is a great opportunity that if you know management can embrace this compassion and uh, reasonable expectations, I think that they will set the stage for this power, this psychological safety that will just enhance the productivity of their teams, uh, large or small. So I think that that's what I wanted to kind of bring to this discussion here today. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Perlman, who can continue, you know, this understanding of resilience and self-care and, and gratitude and all of these things that promote um, employees becoming their best selves. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you all. Um, boy, I'm smiling just because I prepared some questions and I'm writing some questions to try to tease some things out. And there's just so much to unpack here. There was so much richness in all that you just shared. Uh, hard to know where to begin. But I, but I think I'll begin here. I mean, I, I, what I tried to uh, demonstrate or, and I think others have alluded to or called out directly is that when we look specifically at the issue of burnout and sort of stress and mental health challenges uh, within sort of the cybersecurity space, it, 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 there's sort of a, it's a mixed bag, right? I mean, there are some advantages to the career that uh, you all have chosen. Um, you know, some of those advantages that re are reflected in some of the higher scores within the equilibrium assessment relate to things like, you know, sense of purpose and meaning for the work that you all do. I, I you know, this to me feels similar to healthcare, right? Uh, we see that in the healthcare space as well. I think the other is we tend to have less, and again, this isn't, you know, universally true, but we tend to have less financial stress than others because salaries tend to be a little better than in certain fields. Yet we know from the survey uh, that both Joe and I uh, referenced that you know over ninety percent of of cybersecurity specialists really felt mental health challenges within the last year or so, and so you know there's probably a number of reasons that are driving that. I mean, top down culture, lack of training, perhaps lack of work life balance at times. So maybe and it's and again. Some of you have, have, have called some of this out, but I want to maybe spend a little more time uh, whittling down on this. Whoever would like to start, what would you say are, what have you seen are some of the leading causes of burnout from your vantage point? Oh, I can go on and, and jump in here. I mean, Julie and, and Lorna both talked about this some, um, and I know we had some earlier conversations about this as we were we're prepping for, for our conversation today, you know, it's not the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that we signed up for that's causing us to burn out. It's all the other stuff we have to do. It's the, the, um, you know, the paperwork, it's the, you know, tedious stuff that, you know, is not really where we really get to ideate and be creative and do problem solving. And so, you know, where I have found, you know, both, you know, for myself and as I've interacted with um, either, you know, even security folks at other organizations, you know, that that's a leading cause. And then similarly having unreal expectations about how much a person can do um, has been a real, real cause of burnout. Um, you know, I actually, um, about a year ago was, uh, in the midst of a, a third party, um, audit, you know, by one of our, our customers and, you know, the auditor was a little bit late coming back from lunch because he had to take a nap because he, he'd had so much other work to do that he'd been up all night and hadn't been able to, to really take care of himself. And so, um, from from my point of view, those are, I guess I would say are the two leading, uh, you know, workplace things that I've seen. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if others want to comment. Um, Ju uh, Julie, maybe you yeah. just alluded. I think uh, I'll let you go, please. Absolutely. So, you know, just in, in response to what Pascal was saying, I, I definitely agree with all of those points. 
Um, and one of the means that I've used to help combat it, um, I would like to say I'm perfect, but certainly I'm not. <laughs> uh, but one of the one of the areas is specific to top down culture. Um, your people will look up to you in the behaviors that you're carrying forward and try and mirror and reflect your behaviors. So if you're not taking self care, if you're not giving yourself space, if you're not expressing a degree of vulnerability to your people, um, then they're going to be resistant to do those things or at least show that they're doing those things in a public way, right? So it's the rapport and the trust and top down. And honestly, it doesn't really matter where in an organization you sit. Most, unless you're fresh out of college, early career talent, in a brand, you know, brand new to the workforce, someone is looking up to you. So we are all leaders and we all have the opportunity from the top all the way down um, to demonstrate good behaviors, healthy behaviors, right? We're all passionate about our work. We all love what we do. Um, and it's easy to allow yourself to become overwhelmed by it and to throw yourself entire, entirely into it. But remember that others are watching and they're going to mirror what you do. So step one comes with mirror, you know, demonstrating the behavior you hope to encourage in others. Then you become more genuine in your encouragement of encouraging those folks to, to do those things as well. Otherwise, it can come across a bit disingenuine when you say it. Yeah, great. I mean, just uh, to reiterate, so as you just said, a little bit of practice what you preach, really model the behaviors as a first step. And and the other thing that that Pascal you you alluded to that I I think I remember Julie or Lorna mentioned when we were having a pre conversation prior to the webinar, and really resonated with me and and my particular field too, which is um, it isn't necessarily when some major event happens that you're feeling burnt out or stressed, right? I mean, you know that's kind of what you trained for. That's what you're here for. And you kind of all hands on deck. It's Joe, uh, Pascal, to your point, it's kind of, yeah, but I didn't necessarily sign up for all this extra administrative burden or, you know, some of the other things you didn't expect necessarily came with the job. And, and, and I think, you know, that also speaks to this idea that, you know, what we do, certainly what you do, and I feel the same way. I mean, there's a lot of purpose and meaning, right, to the kind of work that we're doing. And, 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 you know, yes, there's, that comes with a certain level of stress. Um, but, but, you know, that's what we signed up for. It's sort of these other things outside of that expected uh, roles and responsibilities that can really be the more disruptive piece of what we feel in our day-to-day -day work life. Certainly. I mean, and I think, you know, a big part of modeling good behavior is allowing your staff to set boundaries. So if they need to have that time between, you know, now it's it's time for me to, to take care of my kids or for me to go for a walk or I'm taking vacation time or, you know, I just want to, you know, put work away for a little while. Being able to respect that, I think, is an important thing that we can do as leaders. And I think encouraging your team to think about what those boundaries should be Um you know, is a great way to kind of start that conversation. And you should encourage your teams to tell you, you know, what they need in order to be successful. Um, you know, what, what things they need to do to take care of themselves. Um, you know, as an example, I, I keep a separate phone for work so that I can put that away at the end of the day um, so that I know that if I get a phone call or an alarm on the phone that is with me all the time, I know it's a real thing I need to like drop everything and, and deal with, um, you know, so that I'm not constantly inundated by the noise of, you know, kind of what's in the background. Um you know, so I'm not constantly looking at the things that, um, you know, can rile me up, um, maybe unnecessarily. Maybe I don't need to answer that email. Maybe I don't need to answer this alarm. Yeah. And, and Pascal, again, you're um, certainly getting at an issue that I know is, is, a, is a problem for many of your uh, colleagues within the cyberspace, cybersecurity space, which is this idea of multitasking, yeah. right? And, and, Despite what the literature, even when I read the literature, 
because uh, I sort of suffer from that as well, you know, and even the literature is clear that we're not as productive. We don't do work as effectively, even though we feel like we kind of do at the end of the day. I was trying to think of an analogy. This may not be a great one, so bear with me, but it's kind of like, you know, some people think, oh, I'll have a drink at night because it helps me sleep. And we know that, yes, having, you know, a glass of alcohol, let's say at night will maybe help you fall asleep, but ultimately it disrupts your sleep and you don't really get as much rest and you're going to feel more tired. So it's sort of like in the moment you think, oh, this is working, uh, but it really is working against you. And I think whether that was the best example or not, multitasking is certainly uh, similar in that regard. Let me do this. I, I First, I want to say we have, you know, maybe 10 minutes left. I don't see any questions in the chat. I just want to encourage people, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in there. Uh, Lorna and, and Joe, I want to pull you into the discussion, maybe uh, ask a, a different question here, if you don't mind. One of the things that I'm seeing in this moment um, is that a lot of companies are like, oh, wait a minute, our employees are really struggling now and mental health has become an issue. And so, you know, there's a lot of focus on true mental health issues. Like what are we doing? What resources do we have for our, our employees who are depressed? What resources do we have our employees who are suffering from, you know, anxiety disorder, as I, I was mentioning earlier. And obviously that is extremely important. Where I get a little concerned is it is when it, it seems to sometimes come uh, at the expense of, of recognizing that we really want to intervene before someone gets to that place, right? We really want to be able to know when someone is suffering, when someone is at risk for tipping over into more mental distress and be able to intervene and support them so that they don't do that and they can continue to, you know, feel good mentally, physically, spiritually. And of course, you know, continue to thrive both in their work in their and their personal lives. What, what are some of the ways, uh, and again, perhaps maybe uh, Lorna and Joe, what are some of the ways that you've seen that the leaders maybe can get insight into the mindset of their employees, you know, kind of get an overall uh, temperature of the stress level, you know, what sort of behaviors do you tend to look for that might be warning, warning signs of burnout uh, in your experience? Yeah, thank you. That's another good way to look at this. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, as security professionals, we see never never let a good disaster, you know, go on <laughs> wasted, um, you know, and unfortunately, sometimes that takes an organization to realize when you have, you know, good people leaving an organization because um, burnout is a problem and, and how things are, are happening is a problem. So, you know, so being aware of exit interviews and, and where in, in impacts in your organization and what they're saying, then then understand that you know there's some things that you want to go fix, and so that's that's the, the one of the the most extreme ways of, of hearing and knowing that you've got a problem. But you know the other part is, and I have found is listening to how people respond to questions. How do people respond when they're getting work? Um, what are they saying in meetings when you're when you're catching up on stuff? And and you can start to hear frustration. Um, and dig deeper into what some of the things that they're frustrated about. See people that are not, um, you know, people's behaviors that change where they're they're less able to handle um, uh, conflict with other groups or other people. And so you start to see that there's a lot more complaining and a lot more, um, uh, you know, well, it's not my, you know, I can't get my job done because of, of so-and-so. And you can start to see a different negative talk, which indicates that their, their, their perspective is off and it's causing their perspective and how they're dealing with it actually is causing them a lot of stress and ultimately leading towards burnout. So, you know, it's really paying close attention to, to, to their um, reactions to a lot of things and their behaviors. Joe, I mean, what do you think? Yeah, so, you know, I think that, you know, this sounds very overly simplistic, but one of the signs of burnout for me is when I notice my colleagues, you know, they're online early morning, and when you when you check in and you see their little indicator for their instant message, you see that they're online once again at 9 p.m., and they're probably also working through lunch. So I think that, you know, the information security professional typically is a very driven a very serious of purpose type personality. 
And as a result, I think that when they become stressed and when they have all this, uh, all these demands coming in at once and they're distracted, I think they're, the natural impulse is to keep working harder and longer. Oh, if I just work an extra hour, maybe I can get this done, work through lunch. But I would probably suggest probably to the average manager, whether it be an infosec or maybe just IT or in the corporate space in general, is you know when, when you notice employees working online, and by the way, it's not that hard to detect because I'm sure we all look at our, our you know, employees and how long they're online. I think that you know one very simple, easy tool, and by the way, it's free, and that is try to encourage your employees. And by the way, Pascal, I want to just call out something you mentioned about how managers, it's important to mention this to your employees, not just you know, in your one-on-ones, you know, bring up the bring up the soft skills, bring up the mental health aspects in your one-on-ones with your employees. And one simple tool that can be introduced is is mindfulness or meditation and you can see this in the meq service suite so there are these meditations that are that are offered but the beauty about meditation is it can be done anywhere at any time employees can simply log off or they can just stay at their desks and they can take a few minutes close their eyes focus on their breathing and just taking five ten minutes to interrupt all of that multitasking and all of that context switching. I've heard Julie use the term, I think it's context switching. So all of that takes a toll and leads to burnout. But if we can interrupt those patterns, maybe once or twice a day, maybe a quick uh, dose of meditation in the morning when we start our day or at lunch or at the end of the day, I think we can disrupt those patterns, which is multitasking and just overworking. Uh, Another uh, term, I think, Dr. Perlman, you can probably speak to this. There's a term called presenteeism, where people come to work sick and they never leave their desks. They're, they're there constantly. Uh, I think that interrupting those patterns can do a lot for tackling the burnout and stress that employees face, particularly employees that are are very driven and very singularly purposed to do a good job and, and you know, benefit their organizations. And that's one of the things as a leader you have to do is, you know, we're starting to be more purposeful throughout IT organization, calling out people that are working late or working early and late and saying, stop that. Um, You know, and also the other key thing that we've done is um, as leaders, we have to model that behavior. So when we're sending, you know, we decide to work a little bit extra at night. Well, we all probably work extra at night, but we decide to, you know, don't send out that email, maybe send it out in the morning, because then our our staffs feel compelled to respond. And they go, well, she's, you know, she's working late, I should be working late, too. So you have to model that behavior of having people, you know, have realistic um, work life balance. Well, that was great. Uh, You know, again, interesting. Um, Hopefully, uh, all of you listening can appreciate this. you know, you need to have the data in order to be able to respond to it, right? Now, you can get that data one-on-one from asking someone or observing. Uh, obviously, it's what we do. It's the heart and soul of what we do at Equilibrium is, is more formally and in a scientific way sort of gather that data so that the individual can have insight, so that the manager can have insight. But with that insight, then you have the opportunity to act, right? And I think that's the critical piece. Uh, another thing that comes up that... Uh, I think relates to what what you all were saying was, um, and both at the individual level, that individual or the manager, uh, as long as there's adequate psychological safety, then one of the things managers can do is to help an employee to prioritize when you do notice, okay, what's really important here? Because I'm sure some people listening are like, well, how am I supposed to get all this done? This is all on my plate. If I don't start at at six in the morning and go to nine at night, how does it get done? And for the managers that recognize that, you know, that's not sustainable for that employee, there's an opportunity to step in and help that employee to prioritize and understand what's really important. And ideally, as Joe, you were saying earlier, if the culture has the right level of psychological safety, then the employee should be comfortable speaking to the manager and saying, I need help here, right? And so going back to what you said, it's psychological safety, it's also respect and trust and inclusion. 
And, and these are core. 